How does an emerging brand break into a new market? Hello, this is Jonathan Mays, Editor-in-Chief of Restaurant Business, and in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with Otto Othman, the co-founder of Pincho, to talk about all kinds of things. Pincho is a Miami-based chain and specializes in two things, uh, kebabs or pinchos and burgers. The company has received an investment from the Salt Lake City-based private equity group, Savory Fund. Savory has injected some operations expertise, not to mention investment, into the fast casual brand, and we talk about that a lot. Some of that expertise came into play recently when the chain opened restaurants in Houston, We chat extensively about all the company did to expand in the city and what kind of technology they use to find the perfect locations and the impact of that effort. We also talk about the company's recent kitchen upgrades and how that cut the company's service times in half. It is a fascinating conversation on a deeper dive, so please check it out. All right, I'm here with Otto Othman. Otto, welcome to the podcast. Hey, what's up, Jonathan? Thanks for having me. Thank. uh, Well, thanks for joining us. So, uh, tell us a, a little bit about Pincho and how things are going right now. All right. You want me to start from the top? Uh, start from the beginning. Okay, so Pincho, we are we are a Miami-based uh, Latin street food concept. You know, our menu is burgers and kebabs, what we call uh, Latin-inspired American classics. That's sort of Pincho. You know, we started the brand in 2010. My background's in marketing and advertising, and I always had a passion for food. And my mom's kebab recipe was a hit amongst our friends. So I had approached uh, my co-founder, Nadal, at the time, and I told him, hey, man, I think we should really start a restaurant selling my mom's recipes. And uh, we went for it, you know, with zero experience, you know, and we jumped right in. So fast forward 13 years now. Um, we are 13 restaurants, actually, lucky number 13, 13 restaurants across Miami and Texas as well. So f- South Florida and Texas. So very exciting mm-hmm. times. Yeah. Did you have to teach people like, did you have to, um, I mean, I assume, did, did you have to teach people what like a, a pincho was? You know, in Miami, we didn't because mm-hmm. a pincho in Miami is, a, it's, you know, the Spanish word for kebab, right? Not every country in South America calls it pincho, but from, sure. For the majority here in Miami, that's what it's known for. So we didn't really have to teach them that. Um, in Texas, we kind of do have to teach people what the word pincho means. But it's very similar to like, you know, another brand that I love, Cava, for example. Mm-hmm. You don't know what Cava means. You don't need to know what Cava means, right? All you need to know is that once you walk in the restaurant, you understand what it is. So similar to pincho, we were called pincho factory back in the day, if you remember, if you remember. That used to confuse people because they didn't know, they thought, well, what, what kind of factory are you, right? So we, once we rebranded and we dropped factory and we were just called just Pincho, it became just a name. So even if you don't know what it means, you know it's a restaurant. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, but we're constantly trying to you know, educate the guests that Pincho is the Spanish word for skewer or kebab. Yes, I clearly do not uh, know uh, nearly enough Spanish. That's an entire <laughs> I took German in high school instead, which was very intelligent. Not really. Oh, anyway, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about your move to Texas because that's been fairly interesting. Tell us a little bit about that process and, and what that involved. Yeah, so, you know, we partner up with uh, the Savory Fund. Uh, so we brought them on board. They are my business partners now. Terrific group of people. They're based out of Salt Lake City and they are a growth equity firm. So after we partner up with them, I sat down with my business partner, Andrew Smith, and Shauna Smith as well. Um, They're both my business partners. uh, And uh, we spoke about growth, about where should we go? Should we double down in South Florida? Should we open up a new market? You know, what should we do? And, you know, we said, let's let's try opening up a new market. You know, we, we have South Florida. We're very popular. We're pretty known down here. So let's open up a second market just to get the brand, uh, you know, um, a bit more of that brand exposure, you know, from a from a investment perspective to prove out a second market is a huge deal. So we said, let's do it. And so we actually went based on data, right? We hired a company called Saitsus that helped us put together a white space analysis, which is essentially all of these data points that they collect from the guests. We geofenced every single one of our restaurants for 30 days. And we built a psychograph of that pincho consumer, that pincho guest. 
What does that guest looks like? And we went ahead and uh, grabbed all that data and then we built that psychograph with their help and then we threw that on the map of the United States of America and then it finds you a lookalike audiences. It says, okay, based on this spending habit, based on this psychograph, here's where others in the United States uh, look like that and live uh, and, and where they live. And lo and behold, right, obviously you got New York was at the top of the list, California was at the top of the list, you know, because of density. And then Texas was at the top of the list as well. And Texas is a very favorable state. Very, very you know, uh, Houston is very much like South Florida. It's, a, it's a, an incredible city. It's very foodie, very diverse. I'm, I think it's probably even more diverse than South Florida, different cultures. And um, we went with Houston. It's, you know, it's a two-hour flight for me. It's not a five-hour flight to California. <laughs> New York would be good too, but New York is very intimidating. So we decided to go with Houston, Texas, and it has been phenomenal so far. Mm -hmm. New York is is definitely intimidating, that's for sure. Oh so, yeah, yeah. So like, so it would. Uh, let me get this right. So it would it would look at the different in like how granular, like how granular uh, would it get? Like, could it tell you like what kind of neighborhood in in a city you could work where you could locate it's, some things like it's, that? Pretty scary, man. I mean, I don't think people understand how much data our phones are just sending back to to the matrix at all times. <laughs> uh, it's it collects so much data. It we can basically go on the map and drop a pin, and it'll give you roughly a, an estimate on what our AUV would be with like an eighty four percent accuracy rate or something like that. It's pretty phenomenal, man. So I'll tell you, you should open in this neighborhood. If you open in this corner versus this corner, here's what it, this is because of the driving patterns and cars and all of that stuff. Here's what you can expect your revenue to be, you know, plus or minus. It's pretty phenomenal data. And, it, and it's just getting better and better by the day, right? There's a few others that are doing the same. And it's wild. So when I sat down with Andrew Smith, I'll remember this it was day one, right? This is what they call day one. I'm at the office at Savory. And Andrew's like, I got, I got something to show you. And then he presents this for us. And I was just blown away. I was like, oh my God, how do we get all of this data? Right. He's like, well, this is a company that we've hired and this is what we've been doing. And here are the neighborhoods where I think we should open up. And, and by now, you know, we're, we're, we're three for three on the stores that we've opened. They're all doing, they're all doing incredible. The, the brand has been received so well in the state of Texas. And we actually have one more restaurant opening up now in April that I'm excited about. Did it surprise? Did the reception surprise you? You know, I think the number one thing that surprised me the most was how many people came up to me. You know, I'm the founder. I'm there. I'm having fun talking to everyone, right? And then just to really give feedback from people, and and it was like finally food with seasoning. That's what I kept hearing. Like finally, food that's not Tex-Mex, right? Because it's a lot of Tex-Mex, a lot of barbecue. And a lot of Asian influenced foods in Houston. So you got those three are the three big buckets. And, you know, now we're coming with this Miami Cuban vibe, right? With really incredible flavors because we, we pull flavors from all of South, South America, right? So from, from, from Brazil, from, from, from Venezuela, from Colombia, we have a lot of flavorful food. And our motto is foods you've known, foods you know with flavors you've never experienced before. That's our motto when it comes to culinary. So it, I was blown away by how many people who gave us so like praise because our food had seasoning and had flavor. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and then the burgers, we knew we were, we knew we have great burgers because we've won a lot of awards. Um, and I was a little concerned because, you know, Texas, Texas is very protective of being from Texas. So we made sure when we went in there, um, I remember we had this sign that we were going to put up on the sign, on the restaurant called Born in Miami. And, you know, our PR group, our, our, our general contractor, they all give us feedback like, hey, I don't think you should come in, you know, pounding your chest, thinking you're this cool brand from Miami. I think you should come in with, with a different vibe. So we completely took that out and we said, okay, let's just go into the market very humbly. Let's go in saying, hey, guys, we're a Latin inspired brand from Miami. We're so proud to be here. We're so happy to be here. And here's our food. I think that was received extremely well uh, mm -hmm. to the point that now, you know, we, we get people saying that this is the best burger I've ever had in my life. We get multiple people saying that this is the best burger I've ever had. And that's a, uh, that's a really great feeling for me as a founder. Yeah. It's not, um, I mean, I've, I've, 
you know, it's not all that easy necessarily to 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 move into Texas, particularly I think if you're a a burger concept. But yeah. you know, I mean, I can tell you that there were there have been some other Florida based concepts that did very very well in Florida, and then they made the jump to Texas and it didn't work. And then there are some burger yeah. brands that have done real well wherever they were, say California, and then they made the jump right. to Texas. And then that, you know, took a little bit for them to to get through. So it's not easy. It's not, I think, as easy sure. as just, hey, like, let's just build some restaurants in Texas and just watch the customers talk. Yeah. No, for sure, man. I mean, look, Texas, they, the one feedback we got early on is, like, they wanted bigger burgers. Like, so, you know, we were a four-and-a-half-ounce patty, and then everyone – Everyone there is used to buying these monster burgers from different places. You know, we wanted to stay true to our brand. We don't want to change who we are, but we did have to tweak a few things, right? We did have to t tweak presentation, uh, plating, a few other things that we did just to really make sure that we were hitting, you know, what the guests wanted in the Texas market. And we are evolving, right? So we there are some things that they, that folks didn't like that we're removing from the menu. Some things that we are going to add, you know, we're going to localize the menu a bit by adding a double a double pincho burger, right? That should be on the menu all the time versus you know allowing the guests to just maybe choose a double pincho burger. But man, look, um, it is it is a very tough market because they're very particular about their food. And if you are new, I think the best way to go into that market is to be extremely humble, be able to really listen in, uh, hear the feedback from the guests, apply it to your brand as much as you can without changing who you are, which at the end of the day, you don't want to become a different brand in every state you go to. But localizing that menu a bit is, in, is extremely important. Um, and then hiring, right? I think it's all in the hiring. It's all in the people that you hire. When you, I think a lot of brands... Forget the fact that if if someone walks into your restaurant and they don't particularly love the food, but they love the experience and how your team made them feel, that's a huge plus. So I think we were very, very selective with, with the team there, which was a huge plus. Not only that, we brought them from Texas to Miami to train and they lived here, right? So they, they to become part of the culture and the fabric of the brand, and then so when they went back to open up the restaurant, they can really represent us. So it was it was it was a really great, ex very learning experience for sure for me as a founder. You know, opening up a new market is very intimidating at first. I, I I joke about this every time we open the store. I don't sleep for like three days because all I can think about are people going to show up? Are people going to show up? You know, and they when they do show up, I'm like, oh my god, thank God! You know, they love they 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 our marketing did work. So. Our first opening in Cyprus, uh, Jonathan, we had over, uh, I mean, day one, about 800 people. Show really? Up for our opening. It, was, it was wild. It was record, record sales. Uh, and this most recent restaurant in Conroe just broke that record. So we're doing really well. How did you handle all those customers? <laughs> uh, a lot of, well, the support of our team was incredible. And then what we do... Um, we've we've learned a lot from savory so we've upgraded our kitchens like crazy so right now our throughput is double what it is in miami so our kitchens our kitchens in texas have a double make line we have like top you know state state of the art um uh, flat top grills cooking burgers in 90 seconds like everything that we did was to prepare to be able to do you know two thousand dollar hours plus without without choking the business so it was a lot of thought into that and then a big support, you know, big support team. We send a big support team from Miami here to Texas. They stay there, you know, one week prior to opening and three weeks after, right? We're there for the next three weeks supporting our team. And that's the beauty of having great support from Savory because, you know, early on when we were small, I didn't have that kind of funds to be able to, you know, send a whole team out there for, for three weeks. So doubling down on that support system is key. Um, and that's, that's how it, you know, the equipment, kitchen, and the support team. Let's, uh, let's chat about Savory for, for, yeah. for a minute. So I know, how did you, how did you connect with, uh, how did you connect with them? It's actually a, a cool, funny story. I was in New York. I was speaking at a BMO conference and uh, a dear friend of mine, Ashish, he invited me to speak at that conference 
And then when I went there, I, you know, um, I spoke and, and then he said, Hey man, I really think that you should meet these guys from Savory. And, and then I had looked them up and I'm like, man, they only do majority deals. I'm like, I'm not really interested in doing anyone to come in as my majority partner, but you know what? I'll meet with them. And I sat down and met Andrew Smith and Taylor. And I remember I was like, man, this guy says all the right things. You know, he's like, he's a very smooth talker. I'm like, man, this guy says all the right things. So I was like, let me, let me get to know them a bit more. But you know, long story short, we clicked, man. We clicked because his background's in technology, my background's in technology. So like right then and then I was like, man, I really like this dude. Like I can totally see why, you know, he's successful. And then we became friends and we, nothing happened that day. They came to Miami after a few months. They tasted the food. They really, they really enjoyed it. And then, then I went to, I went to Salt Lake City after a few months. I went to their office and that's when I drank the, the savory Kool-Aid, like just seeing, just seeing their operation in like in their home market and their, in their heritage market. I mean, you're blown away. You know, they have 60 people in the support center there just supporting all these brands that they're investing in. And that's when I was like, man, I need this, right? Because it's not just writing a check. You know, Savory writes a check. Like they pick a brand that they feel is one of the best. So knock on wood, they, they thought that we were one of the best. And they support you after that from construction, real estate, marketing, finance, all of that is done in our office in Salt Lake City. And then every brand, all we got to worry about is hiring operators, right? So they helped me find the real estate. They helped me with all the construction. They helped me with all of that, with all of it, which is incredibly difficult. And we don't have to hire those functions. And then what we got to do on our side is just hire the operators and the trainers and go run that, run that store. Um, so I was blown away by that. And then I came back and I said, okay, I got to partner up with these guys. But, you know, we stayed friends talking for two years and then COVID happened. And then during COVID, um, we actually did extremely well as a brand. And then we kept the conversation going. And then, and then that's when I went to my board and I said, hey, I, I would like to do a deal where I would buy back all of our franchise restaurants. I don't want to franchise anymore. I want to control our destiny a bit more. And I think I found the right partners. And I was able to convince my, my you know, previous investors in getting that deal done. And yeah, so we went through a diligence process with Savory. It was it was a, a long process, and uh, we partner up on in September of twenty one. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was great. Let's chat about the decision to shift away from from franchising. Um, yeah, why did you make? Why did you decide to? Um, you know, to do that. Everyone thinks it's super sexy to franchise, right? Because we all look at McDonald's, right? And you're like, oh my God, McDonald's, look, it's a franchise. Every founder that I meet that opens one, two stores tells me, I'm going to franchise. And then, and that's how we were in the beginning, right? We want to franchise. So we franchised because we needed capital to grow. We didn't have the money to open a bunch of stores. So we said, let's use franchising as a vehicle to finance our growth. So we franchised early on. Um, and we've learned a lot, you know, and I've had a tremendous amount of support with that because Jim Mises, which is one of my mentors, and I, I love Jim, so shout out to Jim. He was our board member and later became our chairman. So I had a lot of franchise experience on our board as well. So we felt very comfortable in franchising because of that. Between him and Andy Howard, which is also another, another one of my mentors and investors, and then we went for it. But it's hard, man. It is hard dealing with four or five franchisees was a nightmare. You know, two of them were great, two of them weren't, and then all these different personalities. And it's a full-time gig. And I think, I think if you if you have a concept that has really high volumes, right? Take like Dave's Hot Chicken now. Um, and then you have a strong financial backing, I think, sure, go for it. But if you're starting and you're small and you're like, you know, three restaurants and you're gonna go open up franchising man it takes a lot of effort a lot of money it's a it, you need two different teams and we had company owned stores so i and the person that runs your company owned stores it's not the same guy or girl that's going to support your franchisees it's two different mentalities right supporting franchising you it's like a marketing and you need to have a undergrad in psychology because <laughs> you need to deal with all these personalities you got to it's it's a whole different way of supporting where if you're an operator you're more hands-on, you're building your team, it's about your culture and all of that. So 
So it was hard. So we were doing both. And I think that was the mistake. I think if we only had one or two company owned stores and all we did was say, okay, we're going to run these two stores and we're going to franchise the rest. I think it would have been easier. Mm -hmm. So I said, we're making good money. We have great top line sales. The cash and cash returns are great. Why franchise? Let's just do it ourselves. Um, and that's what we did. And it was a great decision, by the way, because now we're 13 restaurants. They're all ours. All we have to do is, you know, hire one team of operators versus hiring two different teams. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to forget that, you know, franchising versus store operations are two actually very different. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, if, I, I remember, and it's a small little example, I remember one of our franchisees wasn't doing a good job with his team. There's nothing I can do about it, right? Because from labor laws perspective, I can't go in there and just let go of someone or protect their employee from something. It's like where for us, if there's something, anything happening in one of our restaurants, we will immediately make a decision to either part ways with someone or hire someone. You can't do that to a franchise um, a company. Um, so it's tough. It's very hard. Right, right. So now did yeah. Savory, did they walk into your restaurants and take a look at like, all right, you need to do this, this, how did that, how did that work? Because they, they've given you, yes. it sounds like they've given you a, a bunch of really interesting tools and technology ideas to, 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 to grow the brand and improve operations. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think they're very smart, right? So part of their diligence process is already uh, building a 100-day plan on what that brand needs. Uh, that's So day one, we already had an entire list of all the things that we needed to work on. You know, we work together with them and all of this stuff. So yes, I mean, and that's the difference between getting getting an investment from a private equity that does not have operators versus a private equity that is built by operators. Is that if someone, you know, they're all operators. So they walk into our restaurants, they understand everything that I'm, like they understand my lingo, my language, my pain points and everything. So we, walk, we walked all of our restaurants. We created a 100-day plan on everything that we needed to do from uh, increasing our throughput, from, from making you know, even visibility of our restaurants, the branding, POP, everything that they thought would uh, add value. And man, day one, we already had, you know, stuff to, to work on. And I think one of the biggest things that we did was we redid all of our kitchens. You know, I mean, it, it was expensive, which, which you know, Thank, thank, thanks to that investment, we're able to do all of that. But we, our ticket times went from, you know, 15 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes. When we were really busy, you know, because when we're really busy, it, it, it goes up to 15 minutes. When we're not, we're under 10 to now being consistently at six, seven minutes, right? Um, all through the addition of technology in the, in the kitchen side, you know, we've worked with, um, with the Savory team to build what that kitchen looks like from day one. So... There was a lot of a lot of great feedback. You know, some stuff we didn't agree on. You know, naturally, uh, but for the majority, we're like ninety eight percent of the time we think alike, which is incredible. That that's the beauty of being partners with an operator is that you're always aligned. Mm -hmm. So you increased, you improved your speed at peak times from from up to fifteen minutes to six to seven. Yeah, man. Yeah, in wow. Texas, we're actually at four minutes, four or five minutes sometimes. Right, so. Oh. It's very, very different. You know, we're, we're cooking burgers in 90 seconds. You know, uh, we're cooking kebabs. It used to take us 10 to 12 minutes to cook a fresh kebab or a chicken kebab. Now it's taking us five minutes to cook a kebab. Um, and then with this double make line that we've created, um, it's, it's very fast. It's a very fast and very efficient kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's that done to the business? It's great. You know, uh, we had... Uh, we had, well, we had an increase in AUVs. We had an increase in guest sentiment, you know, and we just, we just got word that, you know, we had the, the highest rated uh, year over year uh, guest sentiment by, you know, this other company that, that it has a restaurant power index. We just received word a few weeks ago. So, man, I mean, just overall, the guest is loving us. We, man, we've increased our, our guest satisfaction scores from like a 4.0 to a 4.8. So, that's how much, right? We and, and you know Yelp. Yelp can be brutal sometimes. Some of our stores were underperforming on the Yelp side. We have always had high scores on Google My Business, but right now we're like at 4.8, you know, in across um, Google and Yelp and Facebook and all of the above. So it's been phenomenal. 
Wow. Amazing what can happen when you improve speed like that. Oh, yeah. Look, at the fast casual segment, you know, what people care about is, is speed, price, and consistency. That's, you know what I mean? We're not a fine dining restaurant. I want my food fast. I want it for a good price. And I want it to be consistent all the time, you know? And that all sounds easy. It is actually really hard to do. <laughs> it's really hard to do those three, especially if you're a culinary driven brand like us. Because we're a very culinary driven, you know, we're not just doing your regular, you know, uh, uh, burger. We're we're doing all pulling from all these different flavors, and then we have kebabs and we have bowls. You know, as we're a lion street food concept. We're not a burger joint, although we we are very very well known for our burgers. So it's been, um, you know, increasing it, increasing the speed is everything, man. You know, it really is. People, there's an expectation. People walk in to a pincho, they want their food under ten minutes. They don't want to wait fifteen. They get upset if they wait 15. <laughs> you, you, you would too, right? You walk into a Shake Shack or a burger or, or, or a Five Guys. If you're waiting 15 minutes for that burger, you're going to get upset. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, uh, I am not a patient person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> same, same. same. Yeah, I don't think it's just you. I think it's everyone in this new world, right? Everyone oh, yeah. is very on the go. Atten- Nobody has an attention span anymore. And I, and I say that as somebody without an attention span. And... and <laughs> You know, so we people don't have an attention span and, you know, and waiting and people are busy. And the other thing is like yeah. convenience, you know, speed and convenience, not only it really does matter and people will pay for it. And, and oh, yeah. they have an expectation that, you know, with the amount of technology that's available and, um, you know, with I think some of the prices that people are paying for things that they're expecting things with relative uh, with yeah. relative speed. We- and I think there are very few brands that can get away with not doing that. I mean, yeah, we, we, yeah, you know, it's it, it, Miami specifically, Jonathan, is I still don't understand how people are willing to pay the prices that they're paying for a convenience. It's just the way the city is built. Um, I, I can't, I can't explain to you, you know, 40% of our sales are third party and people are paying a premium for it and they just don't care. In Miami? Or is that yeah. overall? Just no, in Miami. Miami. In Texas is completely different. The Texas no. is like 10% of our sales are third party. Mm-hmm. Here in Miami, I don't know if it's the way that the city is structured. It doesn't have great transportation. I don't know. It's something about the city where people are like, no, yeah, we'll just order from Uber Eats. It doesn't matter. I, I don't no. care if I'm paying 20% more, 30% more. People are just willing to pay. Oh, well, you know what? If they're willing to pay for it, I mean, that's hey. the, people are willing to pay we're, for it. It's, it's their we're going to meet our guests wherever they want us to be. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to pay for that convenience. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sir, this was great. I really appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Loved it. Thank you, man. It's been a while since we've uh, been able to chat. Thank you for inviting me, man. It's uh, It's been great. And that should do it for this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, which was edited, as always, by Spoons, artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. Or you may subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.